that, that you will help us to take what we learn and apply it to our lives. In your name we pray, amen. All right. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9, we have looked at this verse several weeks in a row. We read much of the chapter a few weeks ago. We're not going to do that tonight. But Ephesians 3, 9 says, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. And we've talked about way back in the beginning how Adam and Eve were placed in a perfect garden with the opportunity to choose to disobey God because God put within that garden a tree and told them not to eat of it. And they chose to eat of it. And I want you to remember as I'm saying these things, this, this is the Apostle Paul in it, when he's writing to the church at Ephesus says, is talking about the mystery. And he talks about how the mystery is his to reveal, but it has to be revealed through God and through His Word, through His Spirit. But what is that mystery? Well, I believe it begins in the fact that we have a choice, as we see from the very beginning. So, so we, we studied that, then we studied Abraham, and we studied the fact that he made a choice. God called him, he heard, and he obeyed, and he followed God and believed him, and it was counted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. From, from Abraham came the people, God's people, the Israelites, and they came out of Egypt. They were in Egypt for 400 years. They came out of Egypt and they met God at Mount Sinai in the desert and they received the law. So, so we're still talking about choices, right? But we see through human history that Man has made poor choices many, many, many times. In fact, the people who choose to do what's right and choose to serve God are in the minority. So God, through his people, sends the law, and there's a purpose for the law. Its purpose is to point out man's sinfulness. In Matthew chapter 19, the rich young ruler meets Jesus. Jesus is the one who's come to fulfill the law. And he meets this young man who says, I have kept all of the law. He, says all, he tells Jesus, Jesus says, you know the law, you know what it says. He says, all these have I kept from my youth up. Jesus says, one thing thou lackest. Here's, here's what we see in all of this. Keeping the law doesn't deal with the sin principle. Jesus said, one thing you lack, and that is this, you need to sell everything you have and give it to the poor. This is a perfect illustration. If you hear people come and say, Jesus had one principle in all of the gospel, and it was always love. And a lot of times what those people are saying is, you don't love me because you don't affirm me. Jesus was representative of God's love, and everybody that he came into contact with that had any kind of depth of a conversation with, he confronted. I mean, this is Jesus, whose purpose is love, told Peter, his closest disciple, or one of the three, he said, get thee behind me, Satan, to Peter. He confronted the woman at the well and said, you're right, you don't have a husband, you've had five. And he told this young man, yes, you've kept what you see as the law, but you still have a problem, you're lacking one thing. And he wasn't saying that forevermore the principle is that you sell everything that you have and give it to the poor to be a Christian. He was confronting that young man's problem, and his problem was that his belongings and his goodness and his perceived position in society was his God. The law's purpose is to condemn sinfulness. Romans 7, 7 says, I had not known sin, but by the law. Jesus confronted people, but he did it every time. It's not wrong to say that he's love. Because he did it every time with love. In fact, 
Matthew 19 says he looked on this young man and loved him. When he sat with the woman at the well and said, you're right, you, you don't have a husband, you've had however many husbands, she didn't get up angrily and storm away. Do you know why? Because she knew that Jesus loved her and was confronting her for a purpose, and she was able to be changed and converted by him. Now, Romans 8, 1 through 4. I'm going to read this to you. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Think about that. Jesus confronts people, but when they accept him, there's no condemnation felt to them. It says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit, for the law of the Spirit of life uh, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. The law doesn't have the ability to change people. It points out sinfulness in people so that they see their need for a Savior. Jesus, as the Savior, came, and while he made people aware of their sin, he also offered a remedy for their sin. I want to talk briefly about the three parts of the law. There's the ceremonial law. That was the part that pointed forward to Jesus. Jesus came and in Matthew 5, 17 said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And it was Jesus who fulfilled the ceremonial law. There was the national law, the law of ordinances. That means uh, the things that um, kept things peaceful and in line for their day-to-day -day life. It was code enforcement. There you go. It's not necessary to salvation, by the way. And then there was the moral code, Ten Commandments. Um, Jesus reiterates it. There's the golden rule. This is God's law. Now I want to talk about Righteousness unto holiness. Whenever Jesus was confronting people and saying, you are a sinner, whenever he saw Zacchaeus in that tree and said, you need to come down, and, and he was bringing him down so he could look, him, look at him in the eye, because Zacchaeus was short, <clears throat> and he was letting people know everywhere he went that they did not measure up to the divine law. But we also understand that we can't keep the most basic law by ourselves. If we started today, all of us who are here, and said, I'm going to make sure that I keep every law that God has put in the Bible, if we did it, if we could do that, if the very youngest at three years old could do that before probably the age of accountability, he would still be condemned before God because we are born sinners. And born as sinners, he wouldn't be able to do it, by the way, as his mother and father would testify right now. And <laughs> we can't keep the most basic law in and of ourselves because we are born sinners. The Methodists used to ask each other this question, have I loved the Lord with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. So this is what they were saying to each other. Have you, have I, loved the Lord? Yes, I've loved the Lord. How about like this? With all of your heart? With all of your soul, have you loved the Lord? With all of your mind, have you loved the Lord? With all of your strength, have you loved the Lord? The point is this, that we have a basic problem. We're sinners. We're born sinners. We cannot be anything but a sinner. We violate God's law. What is the answer to that basic problem? A heart bent toward putting self first and rebelling against God. That's who we are. There is a remedy. Ezekiel 36, 26 says, A new heart will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take, the, uh, take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh. I will take out your hard heart, 
and give you a heart that will respond to me, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. That means that God the Holy Spirit, when we allow him to come into us and to work in us, we will walk in God's laws. And Well, let's, let's move on. Whereas the law was external, and the law is contrary to our human nature as we're born, and the law only has the capability of condemning us, when it is written in our hearts, when it becomes our nature, when it's internalized, it becomes a part of who we are, it's natural to us, and it guides us in living for God, which, by the way, is the good life. God's purpose for the law is clear at Sinai. The people needed to have before them in writing, under, understand what I'm saying, at Sinai, these people had been in Egypt for over 400 years. Do I need to explain, you, explain to you what Egyptian culture was? It was completely idolatrous. It honored things that are weird to honor. And they, they, were, they would uh, sacrifice to their idols, which meant much of the time were cows. Okay? That, that's why when the people came out of Egypt and they wound up at Mount Sinai and Moses went up on the mountain and he stayed there longer than they expected. And they waited and they waited and they waited and they said, well, I guess we're just going to need to make our own God. And you remember what they made. They made a golden, thank you, calf, right. Well done. And they made a golden calf and worshipped it. They clearly had some needs, and the first thing that God did with them after he brought them out was to bring them to a place, and they stopped at Mount Sinai to meet God. And part of that was God wrote down for Moses the things that they needed to hear. And the first thing that they needed to hear was the moral law so that they knew what was wrong. More concisely stated, they knew what they were doing wrong. They knew what was coming. That's the ceremonial. That the ceremonial law is prophetic, and they knew what to do. They knew how to live day to day. That's the civil law. But we can see that the law clearly didn't change the hearts of men. We... we we know that it went on for thousands of years, really, until, until um, Jesus came. But the law pointed to the one who could change their hearts. <clears throat> now, <laughs> we were just talking about this, because people get hung up here. They think that to keep God's law, they need to keep all of the Mosaic law. They need to keep all of the ceremonies. And they need to keep all of the things that Jesus fulfilled. The ceremonial law was prophetic, remember that, and it pointed to Jesus. The Apostle Paul made it clear that that's not what we need. And I haven't, I had some scripture laid out and I didn't read it, but I do want to read this to you, okay? Um, I started in Ephesians 3, but that's not where I want to go. I will find it here, though. Colossians chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing, o triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat, 
or in drink, or in respect of an holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of the things to come. That is saying that these were prophetic, but the body is of Christ. Let no man beguile you of your reward in it, or in voluntary humility, and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he had not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding the head, that's capitalized, from which all the body by joints and bands, having nourishment, ministered and knit together, increaseth with the increase of God. This is what it comes down to. It comes down to we will serve a master. Who is that master going to be? I, said, I just said people get hung up on, on trying to keep the Mosaic Law. You need to understand that the Mosaic Law has three parts. Two of them did not exist before God. I'm, well, they, they weren't written down and people didn't really practice them prior to Moses. But the Ten Commandments did. Because it was a moral law and people kept it. The civil law did not exist. Although the civil law is good, in fact, it's amazing. When God established law for a nation, and, and the ceremonial is as well, but it's purely prophetic. When God established a civil law for a nation, he established it well. He thought of, of course, I was going to say he thought of everything. That's because God knows everything. And of course, his law would be perfect. But it comes down to, are we going to serve God and he's going to be our master or are we going to serve ourselves? And through serving ourselves, we play into the hands of Satan. What or who will it be? Sin? Righteousness? Righteousness, or would it be sin unto death and righteousness unto everlasting life? We're going to serve God, or we're going to serve the things of this world. That's our choices. When it comes to the mystery that the Apostle Paul is talking about in Ephesians chapter 3, this idea of choices has much to do with it, and... In fact, I believe it has everything to do with it. And we're going to continue to study this as time goes on. So, thank you for being here. We're going to finish this Bible study by praying together. Um, and I just, I received a message from Jordan Sankey that they had uh, people who, more people who attended they began their services this afternoon in Albuquerque with at 2 o'clock this afternoon. And they had people who had never been there before who came already. First time of doing it. So that, no doubt, is encouraging to the people who are left there. Emilio, who I should have mentioned this morning, we want to put him on our prayer list. He does have cancer and he's fighting actively. Pray for Emilio. And then Vicky, who is simply... Probably slight Vicky Christy. Thank you for looking at me like that and letting me know I said something weird. Christy, who's who's working very hard to learn the systems of the church so that she can hold things together while they are in this time of transition. All right. Let's pray together. Our Father, we come to you and we thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you for your word. Thank you for what we see in it. Thank you for speaking to hearts tonight. Lord, we, we pray that you will be with each one that was mentioned this morning. We think especially of the church in Albuquerque, and we think of um, the new people that were there, the people who are there to Jordan and Heidi and their family and Christy and Emilio, and we pray that you'll give Christy strength, give Emilio a physical touch, and give him healing, Lord, is no doubt... It's important for him to be at that church in Albuquerque. Lord, we pray that you will be with uh, Trevor 
continue to give him a healing touch. We pray that you will just uh, help him and his family. Be with those who are sick, that we might not mention this evening. Be with those who have lost loved ones. We pray that you'll be close to each one of them. Be with us throughout this week, prayer time, trunk or treat, coming together again, Lord, on on next Sunday. We pray that you'll just be close to each one. Be close to those, uh, we pray, we think of Valerie, Lord, who isn't here tonight. She and Jim couldn't come tonight because she's not feeling well. We pray that you'll be close to her as well. Lord, we pray that you'll go with us and bring us back together again according to your will. In your name we pray it. Amen. Thank you for your attention. We are dismissed.